message from God's Word. Here is Damon Albert. I want to begin by reading a passage of Scripture found in 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 33. They worship the Lord, but they also serve their own gods in accordance to the customs of the nations from which they had been brought. Now what I would do is I would really strongly encourage you to read the entire uh, chapter 17 so you have a, a good understanding of the background and what's going on in the story. But I'm going to give you just a quick nutshell to bring you up to speed where we find the context for this particular passage of Scripture. First off, you need to understand that the, this involved various people groups that had been moved into the region of Samaria. So the Bible says earlier in the chapter that as the people moved into that region and that area, they were coming from various uh, areas across the land, and it says that they did not fear the Lord. As a result of them not fearing the Lord, uh, there were lions that were released. God actually brought lions uh, among them, and the lions ended up killing a handful of people. And so what happened is there was a panic, an outcry, and the people started crying out to the king, and they were saying, we don't know what the God of this land requires of us. Look, these lions are coming in killing people. We don't know what he requires. So the king decides he has an idea that he's going to get a priest, um, a priest of God, and he's going to send this priest in to teach the people of the land what the God of that land requires. What's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob requiring the people to sacrifice and worship, basically to teach them and show them how to worship God? And then what we do is we find this passage of Scripture that explains the end result after this took place. After the priest of God comes in and he shows them and he teaches them and he talks to them about worshiping, we find this passage of Scripture. And this passage of Scripture is pretty revealing because what it says is it shows us that they did not exclusively worship God. They just blended them in to what they were already doing. So they already had these other gods and these other idols and these other things that they were doing. And instead of being exclusive and solely worshiping God, they just blended, they just pulled him in to everything that they were already doing. So they worship God, but see, they were also worshiping Tartak, and they were also worshiping Adramelech and Anamelech, and they were also sacrificing their children to Moloch in the, in the fire. So as I read this passage of scripture, I can't help but make uh, a comparison and a connection between the what how this group of people responded to to how to worship God with the blending of their culture and the gods that they were already worshiping and when I see this I can't help but make the comparison to many American Christians today do you know the reason statistics have shown and stated that over 240 million Americans identify as being Christian. 240 million. Now some statistics say there's only 331 million people in America. So the mass majority of, of people in America are identifying as Christian, evangelical, born again. Yet abortion is still legal in our country. Yet, America is one of the leading producers of pornography. Ch child uh, sex trafficking is on the rise in many of our cities. Jails are overpacked and overrun. We have neighborhoods um, in, in certain areas in the country that are losing 30, 40, 50 kids to gang violence every single weekend. Methamphetamines and drugs and narcotics are on the rise in a lot of places across America, yet I'm supposed to believe 240 million born-again Christians are in America? See, many of those Christians, cultural Christians, they're, they're attending church. 
I don't question that many of them were probably wearing a cross or a Christian t-shirt. I don't question that many probably pray before meals. Uh, I don't question that many probably uh, listen to Christian music and probably go out and watch Christian films. But the issue is that they're not exclusively Christian. They're blended. They're not exclusively Christian. They are cultural Christians. Now that's a term that I've used for years to describe Christianity in America. But let me give you a really good definition of what I mean by cultural Christian. What I mean is that that the definition of Christian is defined by the standard that is um, accepted and normal in America. That doesn't mean that they're Christian. That just means that that according to American culture, you're it's safe to to identify yourself as a Christian if you do A, B, C, and D. Now, that doesn't match the biblical definition of Christian in most cases. And it definitely doesn't match the historic definition of Christian for thousands and thousands of of years and generations upon generation. Truth of the matter is, the way that Americans define Christianity really is fairly new to Christendom in general. And it's only been around for, let's say, 60, 70, 75 years. You know, we ran into this a lot uh, as we were working with homeless and drug addicts and prostitutes with the family care centers and the different outreaches and the ministries that I've done in urban inner city areas. And in back in like 2000, you know, early 2000s, mid 2000s, as I had daily interaction with with gang members, daily interaction with uh, drug addicts, daily interaction with the homeless and prostitutes and and people that are living on the street, I I was just shocked at how many people I would sit down with. And it was the mass majority. I'm talking 90% of the people that we would sit down with and talk and pray with. And I begin to ask them, where are they at with the Lord? And the answer was universal. They would say, I'm good, Pastor. I know Jesus. And I'd say, you know Jesus, tell me how you know Jesus. And they would say, well, we were at the soup kitchen and Pastor so-and-so told me to repeat this prayer after he said it and then write down the date. And they said, I was good to go and don't ever let anyone tell me I wasn't. Meanwhile, these people are still in bondage. They're still addicted. They're still hurting. They're carnal. They're full of lust and anger and addiction and garbage. See, according to American cultural Christianity, all you would have to do is repeat a prayer or maybe attend church or do some sort of other outward thing that appears culturally Christian. But we can't define our Christianity based on what the culture is defining it as. It has to be defined by the Word of God. And only the Word of God can define what it is. I think one of the best definitions of Christianity, honestly, is found in 1 John chapter 2. And it says, The man who says that I know God, the man who says I know Jesus and that I'm a Christian, that I'm born again, the man who says that with his mouth, who's professing like 240 million Americans profess faith in Jesus, the one who says that I know him but does not obey his commands is a liar and the truth is not in him. The truth is not in him. That means that just because I say I'm a great chef doesn't mean I'm a great chef. Just because I say um, I drive a Ferrari doesn't mean I drive a Ferrari. There has to be some evidence to my proclamation. In Christianity, up until the last 50, 60, 70 years in America, there was people would, would be told the gospel and then they would wait to see if there was the fruit of a life change and a heart change that took place in their life before they would say they're a Christian. 
Because 1 John 2 says the man who says I don't know, I know him, but doesn't obey his commands is a liar and the truth's not in him. Somehow we've gotten away from that in our culture. And I want to tell you, you know, as I read this passage of scripture, my heart breaks because of the false hope and the false confidence that is out there just because somebody is, is, has, has presented this cheap gospel and this counterfeit grace and this watered down what's in it for me garbage that's not biblical and not scripturally accurate and actually damning. So I, I, I rather tell you the truth. Jesus said it clear in Matthew 7, verse 21. He's addressing the same issue. And he said, look, on Judgment Day. In Matthew chapter 7, he's talking about Judgment Day. And, and I want to tell you right now, as we talk about judgment, the Bible says that once a man to die, judgment. That means every single person listening to this one day will stand before a holy God and have to give an account for their life. And Jesus talking about that day gives us a glimpse, gives us a picture and a focus into what we're going to see on that day. In Matthew 7 verse 21, Jesus says many. That means not just one or two, but many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we cast out demons? Didn't we lay hands on the sick? Didn't we do all this outward Christian stuff, even charismatic stuff? Hey, Lord, weren't we doing all these things that, that looked Christian in the culture? And Jesus says, I'll look at them plainly and say, I never knew you. I never knew you. I never knew who you were. Some of you have been around me for years. No, uh, I've taught on that word no before. That's gnosko. That's intimacy. That's the same word of love and affection between a husband and a wife. Jesus said, look, you knew my name. You said, Lord, Lord, and you did all this outward stuff, but you did not know me. I didn't know you intimately. You were just culturally Christian. Now, rereading that scripture in 2 Kings 17 33, they worshiped the Lord, but they also served their own gods in accordance to the customs of the nations from which they had been brought. I want you to think about that for a minute and think about you. Think about Christians. Think about churches that you go to and, and just think about this as, as it applies to American Christianity in general. It says that they worship the Lord openly. A priest had showed them what to do, showed them how we do it. Hey, guys, this is how we do it. You, hey, this is how it works, right? You go in America, you go to a Baptist church, this is how we do it. We go to a Pentecostal church, hey, guys, we throw our hands up a little bit. This is how you do it. It. We, we, we go to a Methodist church, this is how you do it. You go to a, a Seventh-day Adventist church or a Messianic congregation, we do it on Saturday. You go to a Lutheran church, hey guys, we do it on Sunday. So they had a priest showing them how to do it. How do you do this cultural Christian stuff? How do you do this? This is, this is how we worship the Lord. This is what we do. And it says they worshiped him openly, but they continue to serve the same idol and the same sin that they were in bondage in before they learn the right way to do it. It says they worship the Lord, but they worshiped and loved money too. They, they, they worshiped uh, the Lord, but they served the God of this culture. They served the gods of this culture and they did the things that the culture was doing. Like when you looked at, at them and you looked at the culture, they looked the same. They, there was no distinction. There was no difference between the two of them. They worshiped the Lord, but they spent hours in front of the God of sports. Hear what I'm saying? They worshiped the Lord, but they spent hours bowing down to the God of television and entertainment. 10 minute devotion in the morning and hour service on Sunday but then 15, 20, 25 hours a week staring into this television getting fed by the culture the gods of the culture they worshipped God but, but they're purchasing and they're investing in the things that they're putting their money into and the things that they're storing up and the things that they're valuing by their time and their money and their energy 
They're not eternal. They look just like the things that people consume by the culture are buying. And they worship the Lord, but they, they were purchasing, investing in things that are not eternal. They were purchasing and investing in things that, that did not um, transfer into eternity. Things that they were investing and purchasing things just like a lost person would. Or just like somebody who was, was uh, storing up treasures on earth. Just like a, a wise um, stockbroker or a wise real estate investor. They were putting all their energy and their time and their money into things that are just not kingdom things. They were worshiping God, but they still walked in fear. They worshiped God, but they trusted in men. The way I see it, guys, is as we're looking at this passage of Scripture, you got three options. You have the, you can serve your own God. Whatever you think that is, whatever you have elevated to a place of deity that's taken up your time and your energy and your focus, whatever that is, you can serve that. You can serve your own God like they serve their own God, or you can serve the God of this culture. In other words, you just follow what everybody else is doing. And, and I'm not just talking about people that are running in sin and narcotics and stealing and, and blatant sin. I'm talking about you can serve the God of this Christian culture and just go through emotion, just do religious stuff, just be good enough just to, to, to have the title Christian or the bumper sticker in your car that says born again or the cross. Or you can do what God's actually requiring of us which is to be exclusively 100% His. I want to give you one more thought here, guys, too, as we begin to transition into the um, personal application part, uh, section two of the Impart Revival Minute. And, and that thought is this. I want you to realize that as you look at this group of cultural Christians and you analyze your own life and you look at... Um, you know, what are you comparing yourself to to know that you're okay with the Lord? What are you comparing yourself to? It's so, so important to make sure that you are lining your life up in comparison to the Word of God and not just what everyone else as a cultural Christian around you might look like or act like or talk like or seem like. The standard is not them. And the truth of the matter is, is that many, many people, man, look like they're they're a Christian. Many people look the part, they they talk the part, they act the part, they 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 do the do the things and the motions that look like they would be born again. But I, I want you to realize that cultural Christianity, although it appears authentic and it appears like it could be legitimate Christianity, may or may not be authentic. That's why it's so important to know Jesus and to know his word. Let me give you the best example I have of this. The best example is Jesus sitting with his disciples at the table and he says, you know, one of you is going to betray me. One of you here at the table is going to betray me. And let me tell you, if that would have happened today, you know, in, in most Christian circles and Christian tables, we would be the first ones jumping up and say, I bet I know who it is. It's brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. Yeah, I bet. I bet I know who it, who it is. I, I bet. I know <laughs> Yeah. I got an idea, Jesus. I know who it is. But the truth of the matter is, is that Judas, although we know now it was him, you realize that none of the disciples knew it was him? Nobody recognized because what did they do? Immediately they said, is it me? Jesus, is it me? Am I the one that's going to betray you? Now, most biblical scholars believe that Judas had been with Jesus for three years and with the disciples for three years. Do you realize that looking at Judas with the group, not only did he look like a Christian, he looked like his heart was right. He was doing all the biblical stuff. He was doing everything that, G that the other disciples were doing. He was with Jesus. He was with the disciples. And it looked so authentic that the inner circle of disciples didn't even know that he was going to betray him. The, the outward Judas 
in the, the, the cultural context of, of being a disciple fold even the disciples. But Jesus looked at his heart. So Judas looked like a disciple. He looked like a Christian. He looked just like everybody else. But, the, the, but what he was doing and what he was acting in the facade and the front that he was putting on in front of Jesus and the disciples and others was not what was really going on in his heart. And it wasn't the way he was uh, communicating and corresponding with the enemies of Jesus. Friends, my heart in this is not to call a bunch of people out for being cultural Christians. My heart in this is, is that my heart breaks for the mere fact that, that, that people will stand before the Lord one day and think that they're okay because they simply were a Christian in name only. They simply had bought into the lie that says you can call yourself a Christian and do some Christian stuff and actually think that you're going to be okay before God. Yet Jesus himself says, I never knew you. Friends, you can look at this in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 and see the same thing. Jesus says to five out of seven churches, if you continue on the path that you're on, church, you'll be removed. You'll be rejected. You'll have your candlestick removed. Guys, this message is so important, more important, I think, in our culture than anything because we're free to worship. We're like... Um, you know, we read here in this group uh, that it inhabited Samaria. We've got priests to tell us how to worship. But the problem is we have all the culture and all the blending and all the other stuff too. Jesus wants us exclusively his. Friends, that's the only answer. The only answer to, to, to intimacy with Jesus. The only the answer to knowing him and hearing well done thou good and faithful servant is that you are exclusively his. So now it's time for the challenge or the personal application portion of the Empart Revival Minute. This is where we take the scripture that was shared and the commentary or the ideas that were shared and then we directly try to let the spirit of god and his word apply it directly to our heart and our life we're not looking at how the word applies historically not looking at how the word applies corporately um, or how it applies to somebody else but this portion is really about how does that portion or that section of scripture apply to us personally and one of the best ways to do that when you're looking and exploring is sometimes just to ask questions. I know this was a technique that Jesus used. Um, a lot of times they would come to him and he would ask a question. And by their answers, sometimes it would reveal a condition of their heart. So what I may do during this portion is I will um, ask questions, just questions that you can ponder, questions you can take to the Lord in prayer. But I just encourage you to be honest with yourself. Obviously, no one's, unless someone's sitting right next to you, no one's around you um, to hear how you're answering these questions. But I would encourage you to answer them in your own heart um, honestly so you can um, get an honest assessment and see where you might stand on this issue or that issue or a portion of Scripture and how that applies to your life. So as we look at this passage of Scripture that we had read in 2 Kings uh, chapter 17, and we consider um, the words of Jesus in Matthew 7, and we consider the words uh, of Jesus in Revelations chapter 2 and 3, talking about the conditions of the churches. As we're looking at these things, what we're really looking at is, um, personally, um, the question has to come up, am I a cultural Christian? Am I one of those that will stand before the Lord in Matthew 7 um, that says, Lord, Lord? Uh, and, you know, hear Jesus say, I didn't know who you, you were. 
Am I one of those ones in 1 John chapter 2 that confess with my mouth that I know the Lord, but I'm not obedient to him? That's the kind of questions that, that as I read these portions of scripture, I have to look at my own heart, my own life, and answer those questions. There's tough questions, but we can't just ignore them. So I want to give you a couple other questions as we had looked there at um, 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 33. Um, where they were blending um, worshiping God with worshiping all the idols and the gods of the culture. And that question for you is this. Are you exclusively serving God? Are you exclusively serving God? Or are you blending God in with everything else in your life? Is he just an accessory to everything else in your life? Or are you exclusively serving God? Now, I'm not saying that you don't identify as a Christian. Now, the term identify here lately is, uh, you know, got all kinds of people on social media and the news and an uproar. Uh, we recently had this situation where a biological male uh, identified as a female college uh, collegiate swimmer, and he won the top prize. And, of course, people are outraged. And uh, don't get me wrong, um, I, I don't think it's very fair myself, but I think I'm more heartbroken over those of you out there who identify as a Christian, but you're only identifying as a Christian because your DNA and your makeup and your construction and, and the very core and the heart of who you are doesn't match your profession. And that's simply because you've never been born again. If you look at God's word and you look at your life, it, it, it's, it's crystal clear. You know, we have to do more than just be a hearer of the word. We have to be a doer of the word. If we're just hearing it, and we're just wearing the label and our life isn't lining up, then, then we're deceiving ourselves, as Scripture says. So I'm not saying you may not identify as a Christian, but just make sure that your DNA is, is got the blood of Christ in it because you fully accepted him and fully surrendered your life to him in, in every area and every aspect. So as we look at this, uh, you know, these questions, you know, are you exclusively serving God or are you just identifying as a Christian? You know, some other questions come to mind. Are you solely his? Are you 100% his? Like 100%, not, not sharing your affections with uh, the gods of this world, not splitting it, not loving him uh, part-time when it's convenient for you, but are you solely his? Are your life choices? I'm talking about your day-to-day -day decisions. Your, I'm talking about your calendar. I'm talking about the things that take up your time. If you're looking at the things that consume the majority of your time, if you're looking at the things that consume the majority of your money, if you're looking, look at the things in your life that take your energy, take your focus, take your time, take your finances that, that consume you. And if those things are not kingdom focused, like if you can't see how they're tied to eternity or making a difference in eternity, then, then that's, that's an evidence and that's a sign that maybe you're just a cultural Christian. Another uh, good question to ask. I want you to think about the, the, your circle of friends. Say you got two or three. Say you got five to ten. When you look at that group of people that you hang out with, that you spend the most time with, you know, I have a question. Are your conversations with them consumed with talking about Jesus and Scripture and the Word? I mean, is that the number one priority? Is that the number one topic of conversation? Or are those conversations and times just consumed with the culture, consumed with sports, consumed with every other thing. 
I mean, that's a good um, balancing mark to determine, you know, uh, you know, what's the priority uh, of this person that I'm hanging out with? What, what's the top priority in their heart? What's the top priority in their life? And as you look at that, that group of friends that you spend the most time with or those people that you spend the most time with, you know, the Bible says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Well, what's the mouth speaking about? Is the mouth speaking about God? If my heart is full of God and full of his word and full of Jesus, then it's natural that out of the abundance or the overflow of my heart, my mouth will naturally speak about the things of God and the things that are eternal. Again, what's taken up the majority of your time? What's taken up the majority of your energy? You know, John 17, 14, you know, uh, I'll just read that. John 17, verse 14, I'll just give you this thought. This is in red, so it's the words of Jesus. And he says, I've given them thy word in the world has hated them. Now Jesus is talking to his father. I've given them, speaking to us and the disciples, I've given them thy word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world even as I am not of the world. Does the world hate you? Or does the world embrace you? Does it love you? If it loves you, and you easily fit into the culture without making a whole lot of waves, uh, if you're easily accepted in a crowd of people that are lost and, and consumed with sin and carnality, if you're just, if you're just easily in people that are, are just living uh, lost lives are totally 100% comfortable around you and they don't hate you and they just love you and accept you and just uh, everybody's perfectly fine, then... You know, Jesus is saying that, that if I have given them thy word and the world has hated them, if the world is accepting you, then maybe it's because you're so blended they can't tell that you're his. And maybe you're a cultural Christian. And again, I, 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 again, I don't um, share these things and throw these questions out there to condemn you or to make you feel uh, uh, bad or feel unworthy or anything like that. It, the idea is, is that God wants restoration and relationship with you. He wants you to know his voice. He, it breaks his heart. That's why uh, when he was looking over Jerusalem, he was, he was weeping. He's like, how long uh, you know, do I have to be here? How long will you reject my word? How long will you reject uh, my love and what I'm doing for you? And, and Jesus is still crying out. And right up until the day that he comes back, you have an opportunity unless, you know, of course our life is but a mist and a vapor, like James 4 says. Um, it's just blink of an eye. It's here and gone. But, you know, as long as you're sitting here and you're listening to this, you have an opportunity. You have an opportunity tonight. You have an opportunity today to choose this day whom you'll serve. You have an opportunity to not blend um, God in and just fit him in on with everything else you got going on in your life and your culture, you have an opportunity to be solely his because that's what he desires and that's what he wants. And that's why even as you hear this, if you, you feel that urge and you feel that separation and you realize when you look at your life in context of scripture, you realize that you're not where you need to be with him that in and of itself is evidence that he's pursuing you and he loves you and he's passionately coming after you because he wants you 100% solely his. Hey guys, so we've made it to the third and final segment of the Impart Revival Minute. This particular portion of the program is designed basically to give you additional resources to continue the conversation, continue your study with whatever particular topic or area that we covered. 
Now, this uh, first episode, we've talked a lot about cultural Christianity, and sometimes I might throw links up there um, to other messages or sermons, um, practical application, maybe some exercises and some things that you can download. But for this particular first episode and the topics, I just wanted to refer a couple books to you. The first book um, I, I want to refer to you as something that I would definitely recommend anyone read as you're beginning to uh, explore and look deeper on cultural Christianity is, is this book right here. And this book is How Saved Are We by Dr. Michael Brown. Now, just to tell you a little bit about this book, um, this book was published by Destiny Image. And in the early 2000s, as the Lord was really impressing upon me and stirring in me about the difference between biblical Christianity and cultural Christianity, somebody handed me this book. And as I read through what um, Dr. Brown had broke down in this book, it was like such confirmation to me. Right around the same time, I was introduced to a man of God by the name of Leonard Ravenhill. And um, again, I'd encourage you to dig into him a little bit as well. But um, Dr. Brown in this book really breaks down, um, you know, a, a good look at cultural Christianity and what's been accepted um, in our culture. And, and even in the title, How Saved Are We?, you can tell uh, it, what kind of book it is. And it's, a, it's not a real thick book, but it's a great read, and I'd really encourage you to do it. The second book, I'm going to give you three. Um, the second book um, is a newer book to me um, that I just uh, discovered, but the author is not new, and, and it's probably not new to many people, and that's uh, A.W. Tozer. And this particular uh, book, Rut, Rot, or Revival, again, it's, it's incredible. It's not a real thick book either. But again, it really, really um, asks some really, really good questions. It talks a lot about um, just the condition of the church and um, where we find ourselves, especially in comparison to uh, Scripture. And then the last book um, is a book called Pure Vessels. Uh, it's a handbook for reviving biblical Christianity in the heart of today's cultural Christian. And again, I actually wrote this book in 2007. And, you know, one of the reasons that I wrote this book was really kind of what I referenced earlier was a time period where we were dealing with a lot of homeless and drug addicts and gang members. And every single person I, I met on the street was full of sin, um, but everybody claimed to be a Christian and born again. And, um, you know, so I wrote this book because we, we continue to take people down the, the scriptural road in, in a way where people were comparing their life and their walk to what by the Bible and what the scripture says is a Christian and not just something that they heard somebody say. So, again, um, pure vessels and, um, again, dealing with cultural Christianity versus biblical Christianity. So, just to recap... Uh, How Saved Are We? Dr. Michael Brown, Rut, Rot, or Revival by A.W. Tozer, and then um, one of the books that I authored, Pure Vessels, a handbook for reviving biblical Christianity in the heart of today's cultural Christian. So, hope you've enjoyed the first uh, episode of Impart Revival, and uh, God bless you. If you would like to support the work of Impart Revival or the mission of Camp Esri to at risk kids, well, if you're interested in having Damon speak at your church, school, revival meeting, or a special event, please visit CampEsri.org or the Camp Esri Facebook page. Your gifts and prayers are appreciated as we continue our mission to radically preach the gospel and impart faith and a hunger for genuine revival.